Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. I had a dear sister write to me some questions about the upcoming Halloween and Harvest festivals that, that many of us come up against at this time of year. So I want to address those questions in this video. I want to say, first of all, that the practice of um, Halloween is something that is wicked. It comes from paganism and worshiping devils. And that's obvious. You can see that by looking at it. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that because it is so obvious. And the information about that is widely available on the Internet. If you have a, a search engine such as Google, you can type into that search engine Satanic High Holidays, and Halloween is, is the uh, most significant holiday in Satanism. You can also research, and it's not hard to find out, some of the th origins of this particular holiday and why we as Christians would certainly not want to partake of it in any way, nor would we want to encourage our children to do so. However, because we have been raised in a culture where this is a common practice, it's a, a very popular um, holiday, that because of that, it's hard for people to see that it's evil. So let's begin in the scripture. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Because, you know, if something is evil, it's evil, whether people recognize it or not. And God sees things the same way, regardless of how a society might change or what is culturally popular. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Theology is a practice of twisting language so that paganism can be incorporated into Christianity. So the practice of witchcraft uses a perversion of language to convince people that something that is evil is good. One way that we can see that operating in particular is when various religious institutions have celebrations for children that they call harvest festivals. Now, these harvest festivals are Halloween celebrations. And one thing we want to understand about holidays is that it comes from two words put together. So holiday comes from two words, holy day. So when people have a holiday where they encourage children to dress up like devils and to act like devils, when they have a holiday or a holy day where they encourage children to partake of things like spreading before them a bunch of food that is um, that the, is really just regular food, but the child is told that it's things like eyeballs or entrails. That, that when people celebrate this kind of holiday, what they're doing is they're worshiping devils, and they're encouraging children to think that things that are very dark and ugly and wicked are funny and cute. You see, Satan loves this. He loves to corrupt children. It's one of his preferred things to do. And one thing we can see, I live in the United States, so I can speak as a citizen of the United States, having been raised here, that we were not taught the difference between evil and good. I know I wasn't. I know that when I was a child, I was encouraged to do these things. And I didn't understand it to be wicked because no one told me, including the religious people who were my parents. So I had no defense against this evil. 
And Satan loves it when little children can be encouraged to do things that are part of the darkness. Because if you have a five-year-old, or even younger, but let's take a five-year-old. If you have a five-year-old that is being encouraged to dress up like Frankenstein, or like a ghost, or like a creepy clown, or, or something like that, at the age of five, and all the adults say that it's funny and cute when he stands at their door and says something like, trick or treat, and, and the child is told that this means that on this night and this night alone, on this special holiday, that if the, the people in the house don't give them something, candy, that then they have license to, to do some kind of damage to their property maybe smash the pumpkins that they have out front, maybe string toilet paper in the bushes and trees, maybe throw eggs on their car window, you see. So children are, are told that, that these kind of pranks are innocent, it's part of the holiday, and it's just a game that we all play along with. We, we're, we're not encouraging evil, they're not really dressing up as devils and acting like devils, it's just all for fun. It's all make belief but it's all very real this is very real and on this particular holiday the satanic high holiday it is in fact the highest holiday in satanism children are sacrificed children are kidnapped from their loving parents and verily they're sacrificed um, often after being sexually molested you see satanists abuse things that are good and try to corrupt innocence. And when they do so, they obtain power from doing so. So when they encourage children to take part in a blood drinking ritual, so they might have a, a harvest festival, they might have a punch bowl full of grape juice, and they'll tell the children, oh, well, this is blood. Like the, somehow that's funny. And, and it, it's particularly disturbing that these things are taking place in religious organizations that call themselves Christian. And verily, it is calling evil good, and woe unto them that do it. And woe unto them who then make excuse for it by saying, oh, it's just for fun. It's just for fun. Part of it, too, the reason why these things happen is because we live in a culture where we as children were encouraged to do this. And, of course, when we did it, we did find it to be fun because fun isn't necessarily holy and fun isn't joy and fun isn't necessarily something we want to engage in at all as Christians. So things that are fun might be uh, to take drugs. It might be fun to get drunk. It might be fun to go to a football game. It might be fun to go to some kind of movie or watch a certain television program. It might be fun to mock somebody. It might be fun to bully someone. It might be fun to do all kinds of things, but fun is not the same thing as the joy of the Lord. And fun does not bring peace. Fun usually is referring to something that is sinful or wicked. And while it might be pleasurable for a season, it might very well be pleasurable for a season. It brings darkness and death. It's not something that we want to to encourage our children to do. So uh, just to, to kind of sum this up here, this is from paganism. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. And one thing we can understand about evil is that no matter what is culturally popular, no matter what is something that everybody does and everybody thinks is fine, that doesn't mean God has changed his viewpoint of it. So in Isaiah 5.20, let's read. Oh, pardon me, that's the wrong one. Hold on just a moment, my sister. So in Psalm 106, let's read starting in verse 28 and then read verse 29. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him, God, they provoked God to anger, with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. Now, this particular psalm is referencing how the ancient Israelites were rebellious against 
God who had just delivered them from Egypt. And they returned to the practices and worship that they had witnessed when they were in bondage in Egypt. Baal Peor is a reference to the worship of pagan gods, false deities. And these days, in most of the false churches, that's indeed what they do. So Baal Peor is a reference to the family of Baal. So the family of Baal is made up of three individuals, the sun god Baal, the moon goddess Ashtoreth, and the reincarnated sun god Tammuz. In this, in this pagan trinity, what we have is the same thing as the pagan trinity that most people who call themselves Christians now worship. And the thing is, they don't know any better. They don't realize that there's only one God and that Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. That's the birthday of Tammuz. And they don't realize that things like harvest festivals have to do with, with when there's a dying that occurs. The sun god dies and goes into, into the depths of the earth. And then the sun god is reincarnated on December 25th when the sun comes out of the darkness and light becomes um, emergent again. This worship of Tammuz, which most people think is the Christ Mass or Christmas, they think that they're worshiping the birthday of the baby Jesus when what they're doing is they're worshiping an old false pagan deity that was actually a, a devil. You see, so when we as Christians understand this, we also need to understand that many in the world around us do not. And we have to deal with this with wisdom and discretion because people cling to these practices. They think that they're fun. They think that there's no harm in it. And they really just don't see. So we don't want to come across to people like we um, are holier than thou or commanding people what to do. And that's what really this video is about. So if you are a Christian woman and you're in a family of people who are yet not in the faith of Jesus Christ and they don't understand what is wrong with something like this and they want you to bring your children to such a harvest festival, how can you handle this? And let's say that even your husband is um, not yet in the faith of Jesus Christ. So you are a Christian. You've been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, and you cover your head when you pray or prophesy. You may even be homeschooling your children. And your husband is yet somewhat involved in the false religion, as is your entire extended family both your parents and his parents. And now someone is insisting that you bring the children to some um, religious institution and uh, dress them up as devils and partake of a harvest festival. Well, what do you do? Well, what I would say is that this is the kind of situation that, that it's a little bit um, difficult to understand how to handle it, but it is actually very easy to understand from the scripture how we would deal with such a thing. So we approach our husband humbly, and we ask him that if he has the time, we need to speak to him about something, if he could indulge us. And then when he makes the time, and if we approach him humbly, it's very likely that he will make time to hear what we have to say. But we want to make sure that we're asking him to make time for us where we're going to present our side of this to him when the children aren't around, when it's just us and him, and we can speak to him in a way where we can hopefully uh, speak about the matter in a way that he'll be able to hear us. So when our husband makes time for us, what we would do is say he's sitting on the couch, we would sit at his feet, and we would just curl up very comfortably at his feet, not make a big production out of seeming unduly um, submissive or something. Just humbly sit at his feet with our head covered and say, my husband, my heart is very grieved about this matter 
regarding the Harvest Festival. To me, I just can't see what good can come of dressing a child up like a devil and encouraging them to do things like trick-or-treating or pretend that they're eating blood or eyeballs or something. I just can't see that that would be good for our children. And I, it really, it really grieves my heart, and I've really been suffering over this. And I know that our family wants us to attend. But if there's any way that maybe we could appease them in a different way, for example, and we could suggest something like, well, you know, rather than attend this harvest festival, might we just attend one of their church gatherings some week so that they they see that we're not feeling, you know, like we're better than them or something, that we could go and and attend and be polite about it and bring the children so that they don't feel offended by us being standoffish or aloof. And, you know, my husband, you know, I, I want to respect your family, and I know you want to respect my parents, but I this is something that is just very, very grievous to my heart because our children, you know, they're innocent and they, they love God. And when they're told that God's okay with something like this, I think it corrupts them. And I, I just... Um, what, what do you think, my husband? Is there some way that we can, you know, make people understand that we're not, you know, holding ourselves apart from them, or like we're better than them or something, but at the, in the same time, not be teaching our children this kind of grievous message? Verily, if you approach your husband that way, very likely, and especially if you tell him that it's troubling you, it's grieving your heart, because it is because it is, that if you approach him that way, he's going to want to protect you. And he's going to work to find a way to appease all the in-laws with their demands without making you, his wife, feel unduly stressed out or burdened. He's going to want to protect you from that. And if you approach him humbly, he's very likely going to agree with you about the fact that this is obviously wicked, as long as you don't approach him as if you're instructing him, as if you're you're pleading with him. And if you're pleading with him in a mature way, not you know, not manipulating, but pleading with him because he does have authority over you, that it's very likely that whether he speaks that he agrees with you or not, or sees the wisdom of what you say that very likely he will be rallied to the cause of protecting you, protecting the children, and finding a way to appease various extended family members so that there is peace in the family. Now, that's the best possible outcome. It's not the only possible outcome. So I do want to discuss a couple of other possibilities. One is, is that he thinks you're being silly an extremist, and he thinks it's just fun, and he wants the children to go, and he wants you to go. So what do you do in that case? Well, first of all, as a Christian woman who's homeschooling, or even if you're not homeschooling, you have time with your children where you teach them the ways of righteousness. In that time when you're speaking to your children and, and your husband is not there, not that you are hiding this from him, but you're not doing it to provoke him or to be contentious with him. You explain to your children what's wrong with dressing up like a devil, and you show them from the Word of God. And you might turn to, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and, pardon me, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. And you can explain to your children the meanings of various words that they might not understand. A necromancer is someone who worships the dead. They might worship ancestors. They might consult the dead. 
they might ask questions of the dead. This is manifested in, in various kinds of um, practices that a lot of people think are funny or cute as well. And so people tell ghost stories. People um, do all kinds of things like Ouija boards and so forth to speak with spirits. And one thing we can show our children from the scripture, and we can also share this with our husband when we when we're talking to him. But the same people who um, in, indulge in uh, communication with familiar spirits or witchcraft or necromancy, that they sacrifice children to, to, through fire. They burn their children alive. And so children will immediately see that that is not something they want to partake of. And hopefully our husband will as well. But we'll show them that, that the people who are doing these things don't know what it is. So we tell them, you know, that they're not meaning to do something bad, but it's still bad and that we don't want to do it. And it verily, another thing I'm just going to insert here about this is that this is a satanic high holiday where children verily are sacrificed and ritually murdered and their blood is drunk drunken in order to make um, wicked people strong to give them power you see this is a very real thing these things are not make-believe they're not pretend they're of the devil and it's a good thing if our children are frightened by them we should be frightened by them not you know terrified of them but we should have a healthy fear of the darkness we don't want to act like it's a toy you see so at any rate, when we're having conversations as a godly woman with our children, we would be showing them from the scripture these things. And if our husband insists that in some way or the other, our children partake of this holiday, whether it's that we're attending this feast um, with our husband or whether just our children are going to go out with family members trick-or-treating, whatever the case may be, it's very likely that if we are being responsible in educating our children about the difference between right and wrong and good and evil, that they will speak about it. And they'll say something like, Daddy, I don't want to do this. I don't want to dress up like a devil. I, I don't want to partake of this. It's wicked. It's evil. It scares me, Daddy. I don't want to do it. So if you've been educating your children about these things, Chances are that if the adults around them don't know any better and think it's fun, the child will speak up and say something about it. So that's another possibility. Finally, I do want to address what do we do if our husband insists that we attend such a harvest festival at the local religious institution that his family members go to? Well, we have to go because he's our head and we're in subjection unto him. But we would want to conduct ourselves with a, a, a strong desire to hold our own integrity. So while we might be forced to attend, we would not want to partake. And there's some details about this that need to be addressed because in these kind of festivals, frequently not only children but adults get dressed up in costumes. And you don't want your Christian clothing as a Christian woman with your veil and your modest apparel to in any way appear to be a costume. So let's read about this. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs. Pardon me. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 7 we read, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Now, as Christians, we recognize that words like man and he and his often refer to folks of both sexes. It's not just about men. A common thing in the English language is that when we are referring to both men and women, we say he. We don't say he and she. That's a, a modern thing that really has been kind of um, perpetrated on people in the language because of feminism. But in 
very, a very short period of time ago, in a recent times past, when people were referring to both genders, they would simply say he or a man, referring to a member of mankind or the human race. So, the just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. So, as a Christian woman, if we are forced to attend any such gathering, whether it be Halloween or a harvest festival or some other pagan Roman holiday, some other pagan feast or, or gathering, what we would want to do is to be very careful about our manner of dress and how we conduct ourselves. So we don't eat the, the food that has been prepared for that holy day especially like when we're talking about here, we're talking about Halloween. We don't um, bob for apples. We don't eat Halloween candy. And, and uh, we, we just stand apart. So we might be forced to attend, but we don't partake of any of the rituals that are going on. So our clothing would want to be modest and we would want to take care that our clothing not in any way appear to be a Halloween costume. So we might want to wear, for example, this is just an example, a simple denim skirt, a white blouse that's simple and modest with long sleeves, no, nothing um, adorning it like colors or, or, or um, anything that could be construed as a costume. You know, it's okay. It's There's nothing sinful about wearing colorful clothing or, or festive clothing even. But when going to a pagan holiday festival or feast, we would want to be especially plain in our manner of dress so that we're not appearing to be part of the celebration. So I wouldn't advise, for example, I would not advise that a Christian sister wear black on a day when she's being forced to go to a Halloween party or a harvest festival because black is often associated with um, Halloween. The other thing is I would not recommend, recommend, pardon me, recommend wearing anything that's too, um, too, too much, too rigid in its appearance. So I would wear something simple that doesn't appear to be any particular thing. As I said, a simple denim skirt, a white blouse that is modest with long sleeves, and then your veil would want to be something that is simple, not particularly attractive, not particularly ugly, just something that's very simple and something in its color that is innocuous. So I would not wear a bright orange, obviously, a bright orange headscarf, on the day that I'm being forced to attend this um, satanic high holiday. Rather, I might wear a beige headscarf that's very simple and not very flowing, not particularly attractive, just simple. And that way, nobody is going to mistake you for someone who's dressed up in a Halloween costume. The other thing is, is that I would not go there with the intention of preaching to people about the evil that they're partaking of. Rather, I would simply hold my own integrity. I would shine my light. And if someone asked me why I'm not participating, why I'm not saying that everything's cute and funny, then I could open my Bible and show them the scriptures that I've already shown you today, my sisters. I would not make a big deal out of it, though, in such a situation. Because verily, when people are partaking of such wickedness, they hate the light. So I'd be very, I'd use discretion about it because you don't want to end up in a situation where you're arguing with people. You want to shine your light. That doesn't mean you have to speak to people. You could, you could even say something. If you're not sure, you could say something to someone like, well, thank you for asking. Actually, I'm a Christian and, um, I think that this is wicked, and I don't think it pleases God. And if you have more questions about that, you know, here's my phone number. Feel free to call me. And then you're not going to be trying to um, defend the truth in, in a sea of iniquity. 
when we're living in an evil generation, we have to use wisdom about when it's appropriate to speak the truth and when it isn't. There are such scenarios as a pearls before swine scenario. And when someone is involved in revelry and banqueting and they're partaking of a pagan feast and they're dressed up like a devil, verily that is probably not the time to be speaking the truth of the gospel to someone. If they ask and they really want to know, we can tell the difference between someone who's asking because they really want to know and someone who's asking because they're kind of angry and they see that we're not participating and they want to contend with us. That's something that must be discerned. If you're not sure, it's better to err on the side of caution and use discretion and say, well, I'd be happy to talk to you about this at some other time. Here's my phone number. We want to use wisdom and grace because our children are going to be watching what we do. And verily, children are easily manipulated sometimes. So if all the adults around them are saying, oh, come on, it's just fun. Your mom's being a stick in the mud. Have some candy. You'll have fun dressing up. And verily, your children might cave in to that kind of pressure. So you don't criticize your children for that, and you don't argue with people about it if it happens. If you witness it, you can show the disappointment on your face when your child is doing that. You can say it with your expression. But you don't want to make a spectacle out of the child's error. Rather, what you can do is you can recognize that there's time that children learn from their mistakes as we all do. That the adults who are encouraging this were once children who were corrupted in this very way, most likely. So they don't know any better either. So we don't want to come across like we know everything and we're holier than thou. Rather, we just don't partake of it. And we might show on our face that it, it makes us sad to our children. Verily, children who have been kind of manipulated into doing something that they know is wrong, they will know. Their conscience will tell them that it's wrong. And they might come to you, you know, the next day or the next week, and they might say, Mom, you know, I did that, and I'm really sorry I did that. It felt bad to me. And, and I had bad dreams that night. And, and, of course, then we would show our child mercy, because by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And, and so we want to always exercise graciousness as Christian women, not to be in agreement with evil, but also recognizing that some things take time. And just because we have had a revelation about something doesn't mean that we have a right to go around imposing our understanding on people who don't yet have the revelation. Verily, if our husband or other family members do not understand that Halloween is wicked, then we can pray for them, and God will deal with them. God hears our prayers, and will deal with them. And it's not up to us to save anybody or convince anybody of the truth. Our job as Christians is to shine our light. And sometimes what that means is that we just don't participate. We simply refuse to participate, and we also refuse to get dragged into all kinds of contentions and arguments. If people want to mock us, if they want to put us down because we're not participating, the best thing to do in such a situation is to simply endure that in silence. Because verily, their conscience will convict them if we don't get down and roll around in the mud with them. I pray that the, this counsel has been helpful to you, my sister who asked, and also to any of you who have, are watching this video. Feel free to email me if you have further questions or to comment in the comment section below. May the word of God go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' name, amen.